Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module that is part of one of the WITS RHI Advanced HIV and TB catch-up sessions. Um, this is one of the PMTCT sessions and will focus on post-exposure prophylaxis of the HIV-exposed infant. I would like to go back to a slide from one of our previous presentations where we emphasized the incredible risk that the baby is at for HIV transmission during labor. So those 12 hours of labor has the same risk of transmission as the whole 18 months of breastfeeding. Um, and so although we're also covering the mom um, with ARVs during labor and delivery, we actually want to give the baby post-exposure prophylaxis for the six weeks um, following labor. And this presentation is going to particularly focus on how we are covering the infant to prevent mother-to-child transmission. So first things first, within the one hour of delivery, we will do our normal good practice. All infants must have skin-to-skin -skin contact with the mother ASAP. We're going to initiate exclusive breastfeeding, and we're going to start teaching the mom about kangaroo care. But in your HIV-exposed infants, there's a couple of other things you need to remember. As soon as possible after birth, we want to make sure that all our HIV-exposed infants will um, receive um, infant prophylaxis. And although we say we can initiate post-exposure prophylaxis within 72 hours, it's similar to a needle stick incident um, where you would actually want to do it as soon as possible. And of course, um, all babies who are HIV exposed will receive a birth PCR. And we do that as soon as possible because we want to try um, and get that result back as soon as possible. And also the prophylaxis could influence the result. So who would qualify for a birth PCR? Very simply, simply, all babies who have been HIV exposed should have a birth PCR done as soon as possible. Important though that if you're going to take a result, um, there's no point in taking a result if you're not going to be sure that you're going to access the results and also make sure that you can track your mom. So um, quite often the person who is taking the birth PCR is not going to be the one that's going to see the mother um, to actually receive the result. Women are often discharged within six hours, and therefore it's the responsibility of the healthcare worker at the delivery facility to ensure that there's a PCR barcode on the health record or on the discharge record that's going to go with the mom to educate the mom about the importance of getting this result from her clinic um, and to make sure yourself that if that result was to come back positive, will you be able to track that infant? So go over it again and again, the contact details of the mother, and have at least one other telephone number that one can use as well in case one can't get hold of her. And it's very important that all infants with a positive birth PCR must be urgently referred or discussed telephonically for art initiation. Um, and it's the delivery facility's responsibility to ensure that all PCR positive babies have been traced and have been managed. So let's talk about infant prophylaxis. And the choice of the infant prophylaxis regimen is going to depend completely on, on the mom, the risk profile of the mom. So I would like to emphasize again the importance of filling in the maternity record really well during antenatal, especially the start date of the ARVs, um, the mom's adherence profile, and what the last viral load was. Those information cannot easily be tracked in the middle of the night um, and has to be easily on hand. So we're going to look at four specific scenarios and um, we we'll all have slightly different management. The first is our normal well-suppressed mom on art. The second scenario is a mom who has only recently been started on ARVs prior to, to delivery or who was diagnosed during labor as being HIV positive. The third scenario, which is not strictly speaking post-exposure prophylaxis, but fits very well within these, these particular discussion, is the mom who's been diagnosed HIV positive whilst breastfeeding. And then our fourth discussion is going to be the mom who's had an unsuppressed viral load during um, pregnancy. So let's look at our first scenario, and this is where we hope most of our moms are going to be. They were diagnosed nice and early in pregnancy, they've been on ARVs for ages, and their viral loads are suppressed. And for those, the mom will continue on her lifelong ARVs, the baby's going to start on nevirapine as soon as possible after delivery, and you're going to give that baby nevirapine daily for six weeks. Um, and therefore, we don't need to cover the baby throughout breastfeeding. 
um, with nevirapine because the mom is already on FTC and the mom's virally suppressed. The reason why we're using the nevirapine at all is in case there was some virus within the genital tract um, during delivery. And as we've said, that's a very high risk exposure during labor and delivery. And so the nevirapine is purely for post-exposure prophylaxis. Important also is to continue monitoring that viral load if the mom is breastfeeding to ensure that the viral load stays suppressed and that the risk to the baby continues to be low. But let's start moving on to some of our slightly more complicated scenarios. And our first next case scenario, um, let's say Mary was HIV negative throughout her pregnancy until she was 36 weeks pregnant. And now at 36 weeks, remember we are testing regularly, we discover that she's now HIV positive. And as per the guidelines, she has started on the fixed dose combination of tenofovir, imitricitabine and efavirenz on the same day. Um, and now at 39 weeks, she presents to the maternity unit and she delivers a healthy 1.2 kilograms infant. She's going to breastfeed. Um, and obviously our concern at this point is she's only been on ARVs for three weeks and she will not yet be suppressed. So this is our second type of prophylaxis that we use, which is an extended 12 weeks of nevirapine. And there's particular infants that will need to get 12 weeks instead of the six weeks. Those are the babies where the mom has been on ARVs for less than four weeks before delivery, or where the mom was unbocked, um, or she's had been having HIV tests, but is now diagnosed with HIV for the first time in labor or, or at delivery. And in these moms, we are concerned because the viral load might not yet be completely suppressed, um, but we are not worried about resistance. The mom has not been exposed to ARVs in the past. And so we therefore use the 12 weeks of nevirapine to ensure that the viral virus will be suppressed before we stop the baby's prophylaxis. So important to note, this is for our breastfeeding mothers. Um, and if our mother was formula feeding, she would only require the usual six weeks of nevirapine post-exposure prophylaxis. But let's just make this slightly more complicated and we go to a third scenario. So Lindiwe presents at the six weeks visit with her baby for the first EPI visit. Her HIV test during labor was negative, but today her HIV test is positive and she's breastfeeding. So we're going to obviously counsel and initiate Lindiwe today on the, um, the fixed dose combination of tenofovir, imidacitabine and efavirenz. But what are we going to do about our baby? If you think about it, it's quite similar to the mom that we're diagnosing in labor. We're also going to use our extended 12 weeks of nevirapine, but we're going to be adding in short-term AZT cover. And I want to go through this quite carefully. So we're obviously going to do our PCR on our baby, and we're going to put the baby on the 12 weeks of nevirapine. The worry is that this baby is an extremely high-risk baby for HIV transmission. The reason being that your mom has only recently been infected with HIV, and therefore we expected her viral load to be extremely high. We are therefore worried that our baby might already be positive, and therefore if we gave the baby single dose of nevirapine, there's going to be very high risk that that baby um, might develop resistance to that nevirapine very quickly. And so what we do is we're going to add in AZT just in case the baby is already infected. We're obviously going to check our baby's PCR result within seven days, and then very importantly, if the baby's HIV PCR test is then negative, we can breathe a sigh of relief. She's not yet been infected. We're going to stop the AZT and we're going to continue the nevirapine for a total of 12 weeks. Now, I'd like to compare this scenario with our scenario, our second scenario, the one we've just discussed, where the mom is diagnosed um, in the few weeks before labor or during labor. And if you have a mom who you diagnose in labor for the first time, and she had a recent test, which was HIV negative. We actually have a similar scenario where we'll be extremely worried um, that the mom has been recently infected, might have had a high viral load, and therefore the baby is much more at risk of being HIV infected. If you are very concerned that your baby might already be HIV positive um, and you're starting the virapine prophylaxis, it is very prudent and sensible to cover for AZT for a short period of time until your PCR comes back negative. 
Please note that we don't use the AZT here for the full six weeks. And the reason for that is that AZT has also potential complications in the small baby, particularly your anemias and your bone marrow suppression. And therefore, we do not want to use the AZT unnecessarily. If the PCR is negative, we can therefore stop the AZT and continue with your nabirapine. If you are putting a baby on 12 weeks nevirapine, we are going to be following up a little bit more closely because we are considering these babies to have been at higher risk of transmission. So remember, we're all going to do our birth PCR, but at any time, if you're concerned, you're going to do a PCR and if the baby develops symptoms. We'll do our normal PCR at 10 weeks, but very important, we'll do another PCR six weeks after the 12 weeks of nevirapine is stopped. So that means there's going to be an 18 weeks PCR that will be done. Don't forget to do our six weeks um, post breastfeeding PCR and again our normal 18 month HIV ELISA test. So why do we do that? Why do we repeat our PCR at 18 weeks for an infant who's been on 12 weeks of nevirapine? Just a reminder that nevirapine is a very powerful antiretroviral and actually brings your viral load down quite dramatically. And it's very possible that whilst you're on nevirapine baby could quite easily suppress their viral load if they did get HIV infected. So any PCR that is conducted on an infant that might have a suppressed viral load, um, that result might be indeterminate or even a false negative due to the viral suppression. And therefore, it's very important that once the nevirapine prophylaxis is stopped, six weeks later, we need to make sure that this baby may not have been um, inadvertently infected with HIV. So let's go through our fourth case scenario and the most complicated of the lot. Sandiwe presents at 26 weeks of pregnancy already on the fixed dose combination. Her viral load gets taken as per the guideline, but of course it takes a while for the results to come back and at 28 weeks it shows that her viral load is 89,342. As per the guidelines, a repeat viral load is done four weeks later. So in this case they did it at 32 weeks. Um, and the result, again, is delayed at 34 weeks, comes back at 65,342. The nurse quite sensibly just realizes that she may need second line and decides to do the baseline bloods, but Sandiwe does not return for her results, and she presents the next time in labor at the delivery facility at 37 weeks. Just note here the delay from first being seen at 26 weeks um, to the delivery when she arrives at the delivery room at 37 weeks. This delay could have been to some extent modulated if her viral load was repeated at 30 weeks, not at 32 weeks. Um, and when they repeated the viral load at 32 weeks, if the baseline bloods was already done at that point. So now we need to speak about dual infant prophylaxis. Any mother whose last viral load was more than 1,000, so viral load during the uh, time um, that she was pregnant, all of those babies will receive nevirapine plus AZT for six weeks. At the six weeks review, the infant prophylaxis must take into account what the mother's viral load is and if she's going to be breastfeeding. And the prophylaxis after six weeks will depend on those two factors and will normally be discussed with an expert. So it's not an automatic assumption that the six weeks nevirapine and AZT will be stopped at six weeks. So why do we add in the AZT in this scenario? And note that it's different than it is for our moms who's been breastfeeding and diagnosed, where we use the AZT because we were concerned about possible HIV infection. In this scenario, we are concerned about resistance. So we think that the mother may already be resistant to her first line treatment and therefore, if there's resistance to refavirance, there may very well be cross-resistance to nevirapine. So nevirapine on its own may not be enough to cover the infant as a prophylaxis. And so we add in the AZT. And therefore, the AZT is required for the full six weeks. The key intervention for babies on dual prophylaxis is what happens during those six weeks um, before the six weeks visit. Mom's viral load was high during delivery, and now we might need to actively address maternal adherence. We need to figure out when the last viral loads were done. We need to make sure does she need to be on second line. 
um, and we need to look at when that next viral load needs to be repeated. And we want to actually make sure we have an up-to-date viral load result before the next six weeks visit so that we can make a decision about what we're going to do about infant prophylaxis and our advice regarding breastfeeding. So let's summarize our different options at this point. We've got our straightforward babies who's going to get their six weeks of nevirapine post-exposure prophylaxis. And then we've got two other main scenarios. We've got our babies who's going to need 12 weeks of nevirapine because the mom's been recently diagnosed. And we might use AZT for a few days if we're really concerned about transmission to that baby for those very, very high-risk babies. The other scenario is where we have a confirmed viral load of over 1,000 in a mom at delivery, um, and we are therefore concerned that there may be resistance. And in those babies, we are going to be adding in um, AZT to be covering the nevirapine. If we are my mothers who are failing on second or third line, um, and we are busy still trying to sort it out, we have to have a real conversation about breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is always best um, for most case scenarios, but this is one of the very, very few exceptions where we actually have a medical indication for infant formula. If we are going to have a discussion about a mom not breastfeeding, that discussion needs to happen before she goes into delivery and preferably has to be planned for um, while she's still pregnant. Very important to ensure that you can sustainably give that mommy infant formula for six months. Do not start a mom on infant formula where it is not going to be able to be um, continued reliably. If formula is not available, then we're going to be carefully counseling our mom. We're going to focus on trying to get that viral load down and then exclusive breastfeeding is still your best second option. All of those mom babies who have high viral loads on second and third line must be discussed to look at all the possible best options. So let's quickly run through one or two other scenarios. Let's look at the example of an orphaned or abandoned baby where we don't know the maternal status of the mother and importantly the baby is still less than 72 hours old. In that case we can do an HIV rapid test on that infant to see whether there is HIV exposure and we can give the baby post-exposure prophylaxis of nevirapine for six weeks. If the rapid test is negative, it means the mom was HIV negative and we don't need to give nevirapine. If it's a non-breastfeeding mom um, that is diagnosed HIV positive more than 72 hours after delivery or an orphan or abandoned baby more than 72 hours after delivery, then we're not going to be giving any nevirapine, um, but we will be doing a PCR on that baby. We are watching that PCR very closely over time to see whether the baby has been infected. A last note about linking to care. Before our mom goes home, we need to make sure she's got enough ARVs. We are hoping that she will be returning to the clinic at three days postpartum and again at six weeks, but to be safe, make sure she has enough treatment. Make sure the mom's been counseled about both her own ARVs but exactly what is happening with infant prophylaxis, both dosage and adherence, the importance of exclusive breastfeeding for six weeks, and very carefully exactly when and where she's going to follow up. Discuss contraception and really make sure that you um, clearly put your plan in the, the road to health chart of the baby. If possible, book the first appointment for the mother and baby in to the clinic yourself um, so that the clinic can be expecting the mom and will notice if the mom does not show up. Our last slide will quickly run now through the uh, summary of all the infant testing that needs to be done for um, to ensure that we pick up babies who do get infected with HIV early. We're obviously doing birth PCRs on all our babies. We're no longer doing the six weeks PCR, but we will be doing a PCR at 10 weeks to ensure once they're off the nevirapine for four weeks that we pick up those babies that might have been um, infected. For babies who had 12 weeks of nevirapine, they need to get an 18 weeks PCR. It, there has to be a PCR six weeks after the complete cessation of breastfeeding if it's still under 18 months and the rapid test if the baby is more than 18 months old. Our normal HIV rapid test at 18 months. And remember, we do a PCR at any stage if the baby is symptomatic. 
This completes our presentation on infant prophylaxis. Please look at the other modules on PMDCT to complete this particular session. Thank you.